I'll tell you one thing. Tokyo Ghoul, sometimes, yeah, there's things that we don't necessarily are, you know, intrigued enough to really read, like, you know, with Kuroi Wa bench pressing and shit like that, but there is really, especially from what I review, no manga that really can compete with the level of quality as far as just the way the storytelling is done and the expression and just the small subtleties that like you would never think this would have so much impact but it does have impact because of the way Suishida writes like Tokyo Ghoul read just right now I don't know it's just it's not again gonna give you that big last page every single time that is like ah but it will make you fucking excited as fuck in the small subtleties that it does in the incredible fucking writing so two chapters this week starting off with 44 now Kano and his Hawaiian swag I'm like yo Kano what you doing bro He's working on some new experiments and he basically wants to bring back two of Naki's crusties that got dusted off or whatever and it's kind of sad when you look at exactly what the ghouls are to a certain degree. It's almost as if they're, well they definitely are the minority in comparison to humans but because of the hard lives that they had and you know not being able to go to school, they are kind of slow. A lot of them aren't you know the brightest in the box so to speak. I mean look at Yamori. Yamori he was a brute and a nut job but he wasn't all that wise and then Naki right there is getting played by Kano because Kano whatever experiment he's doing obviously Kano ain't no god he ain't gonna poof any bitty bitchy and bring motherfuckers back to life whatever he's doing whether it be adding an addition to Eto's crazy insanity of controlling motherfuckers or whatever the case may be they're not gonna come back and be the same people they're probably just gonna be mindless animals like pretty much on some Kakuja no common sense whatsoever type of deal where they're just basically gonna go ham and not be able to be anything other than killed and when Kano was speaking of his beloved prototype there's obviously three people pretty much that could fit the description you would definitely argue that it'd be Kaneki because that was the first person that he really did it on and then of course I think he did the twins or whatever but like Kaneki would probably be that one but you could also argue that it could be Aman or Takizawa because they were the prototypes as far as the Al experiment goes I'm leaning more towards he's talking about Kaneki but then possibly Aman as well because Aman got free and yeah Kano just like he's so mysterious and you're always wondering exactly what the fuck is this motherfucker after but at the same time when you see this like he's just a, like he's kind of like a mad scientist in a way and i know people hate when i do comparisons or whatever but he's like in orochimaru he's very vague and he uses the science but we don't necessarily know exactly what he's after other than like motherfucker got the paycheck that's why he's in the hawaiian shirt surrounded by big ass ghoul thug and you can see at this particular point heist has gotten to the mental state of like okay i do want kaneki to stay here i want him in my head i don't want him to go away because he that's pretty much accepted the fact especially in these two chapters that there's no way he can hold on and sustain this life that he has because it's a lie at the end of the day it's not the truth and we've seen in that second chapter 45 and i'll talk about it more later that pretty much this isn't really a real life and at the same time though as the readers you know from what we can see if he does get back those memories of ken kaneki and who he used to be there's a lot of tragedy that he has to come to terms with and i think that that will radically morph him if he does have a combination of some sort it's going to be a both life experiences but at the same time will he be able to handle realizing all the people that he killed all the people that he watched die the torture he sustained at yamori's hands the loneliness that he had from you know his mom dying and everything and kind of feeling like he was selfish like there's a lot that'll hit highs when he finally does get the memories back and finally finds out everything it's going to be like a huge wave so i'm curious what will happen and will there be a certain point where he just won't be able to do anything because he's just going to be stuck in misery like yeah I had a pretty decent life like Sasaki's life right now is kind of what if Kaneki never had tragedy and he was a school student and eventually became like a detective or something like that that's the life that he's living now but at the same time it's all a lie and then the other life is just misery and tragedy so it's a combination of very interesting backgrounds when he does eventually hopefully get his memories like I don't think Tokyo Ghoul Re will be a complete series if Heist never gets his memories back it's just a matter of when and Suishida's really just like come on dangling the string to us like you're gonna get it eventually Sui, stop it. And setting up that whole thing with, I think it's Eliza or Eliza from the Tsukiyama family for eventually her to get beheaded and shit like that. Like, yeah, kind of some fucked up gore shit and it's building up exactly how much of a monster that interrogator, Kijima, I think it's something like Kijima. He's a fucking animal. Like, I think there's a lot of karma that's gonna come and bite him in the ass because you've seen how ruthless he is. And especially if he loses his job, do you know what it's gonna be like if he lost his job and ghouls find out it's open season on his mother? Fuck, are they gonna go crazy because especially what he's doing the Sukiyama family he's putting it out on national you know broadcasts and shit like that he's gonna <laughs> he 
Kijima is gonna have a violent death, I think. Especially from everything he's done, it's gonna be a very tragic and violent death. And I think hopefully his character will build up to a point where he will not want death necessarily. Well, I don't know if he does or doesn't want death but if he gets to that point it'll be that much more tragic when he does guys like you fucking piece of shit this is what you deserve and then the meat of chapter 44 especially was when Sasuke went up to Tsukiyama and it's funny because in my last Tokyo Ghoul review I was like I wonder if Tsukiyama will ever get to the point of growth that he'll basically like decide you know what this is wrong I shouldn't be selfish and it only took the following chapter for him to do so like he started to question and I think in Tsukiyama's mind what is going on right now is it's a conflict black Black haired Kaneki was the meal. White haired Kaneki was his friend. This guy is both. What do I do? What is the right thing to do? What is wrong? Like, it's really an interesting conflict in his head right now. And the fact that he walked away from how desperate he was and he finally has Sasuke right there saying, Talk to me. I'm talking to you as Sasuke Heist, not an investigator. And he still managed to walk away. That's growth in him. That's understanding a little bit more of the friendship that he actually values of Kaneki Ken, not Sasuke Heist, but, you know, the person ultimately that he remembers is like, I think he's leaning more towards, I miss my friend than I miss the meal. And indeed, a lot of people have said this and it's pretty much factual. Sasuke Heist is, to a certain degree, a continuation of black-haired Kaneki. And again, like I said, I think it's more so like if he had a good life to a certain degree, obviously it's fake, but if he had a good life, but he's more so the innocent White-haired Kaneki was devouring motherfuckers, going crazy, he was a thug to a certain degree. This is more so along the lines of, like, black-haired Kaneki. And yeah, 44, a very solid chapter, especially with that gruesome ending. Fucking R.I.P. Eliza and the Tsukiyama family is looking like it's really gonna crumble really soon, especially from the events of chapter 45. But 44, very good chapter, 8 out of 10. I mean, slowly but surely, Sasuke keeps on heading towards the home stretch of finding out who he is. Now, with 45, we have Operation Exterminate the Tsukiyama family. So right there, I mean, all of this has been building up chapter after chapter, the Tsukiyama family, the investigation, them trying to find out, Kijima torturing motherfuckers. Now, this is where it's gonna go down. So very big setup in this chapter towards possibly a huge war between the CCG that are trying to invade. I just really hope when the fights go down because in Re, it's been polar opposite for the most part, uh, aside from the ending, from what the original goal was. I mean, I hope that the Tsukiyama family, if they do fight back, if they don't all run, which I don't think all of them can run, only a select few. I hope that they fight back and actually succeed in killing some of these motherfuckers because I hate seeing the ghouls being whipped down. I understand that they were running for their lives a lot. It wasn't completely that, you know, the ghouls terrorized the humans and terrorized the inspectors because there was a lot of times in even part one when like Amon and Mato were torturing motherfuckers and going in and shit like that. So I understand that it wasn't completely one-sided in the original, but I want to see the Tsukiyama family kick some ass. I want to see a really proper war not just a fucking smackdown on the Kagunes. Like, can we get something a little bit more like even to a certain degree and then more with Shirazu I again think that out of all the Quinques thus far Udi is an annoying fuck although you can see some growth in him yet again that he appreciates at the very least Sasaki's strength because he realizes Sasaki's powerful I want to please him to a certain degree because of his strength so you can see that he's kind of changed in that regard Psycho uh, there's still not too much he's still like a mystery but I'm leaning more towards he's like a Gohan when he would go ballistic and become super strong type of character Mutsuki has grown from her days of being completely like black haired Kaneki but there's still a lot to do with her she still needs to grow a little bit more and ultimately come into her own and I think Shirazu is like the best developed and the most conflicted which makes it the most interesting because he doesn't really want to use nuts and he even goes to Sasaki and ask him which that's kind of jeopardizing his position is like you know I'm supposed to be the leader but can you please help me I'm really suffering through this and I think that's where they can all relate in a way like the Quinques is pretty much the best place for somebody like Sasaki highs because they're outcasts as well and the fact that he's struggling with this this is something that Sasaki or Ken Kaneki would would struggle with as well like fuck I feel so terrible about this and when he does get his memories back he's gonna look at this and say holy fuck I completely understand what you're going through the scene with Cordy or Co Cody something like that the chick from the Arima group or whatever I think that that's a very bad setup or not bad but like a bad premonition I get from that with the smile from Arima when Arima smiles I do not feel comfortable I think shit is about to go haywire so I'm just throwing that out there I think that was a huge setup with Cordy you know getting ready for the investigation and the thing that she was gonna say to him maybe she is a bit nervous at the end of the day having all this responsibility now so who knows if somebody's gonna bite the big one from the investigators it could be her and easily one of the best scenes from these past two chapters or one of the best parts anyway is Sasuke flipping the fuck out when talking to Akita who the fuck am I why do you guys keep hiding it and looking at Akita's character it's something 
kind of interesting because it started off where they basically gave her this motherly position of facade, so to speak, which in that regard, it's fucked up because there's a lot of mixed emotions in there. It's Akira knows, if I'm correct, that it was one-eyed that killed the man that she cared about and loved, Amon. So she has to put on this facade of being the motherly figure, but in turn, with putting on this facade, I think she actually legitimately grew to care about him because she's seen, I mean, at the end of the day, let's be real, how can you not like Ken Kaneki or even Sasuke Highs, which is to a certain extent a kind of spinoff of Ken Kaneki, the good nature and everything. How the fuck can you not grow to care about him? So she gave him a hug and it felt honestly genuine. It wasn't just like that bullshit, but at the same time, she's being watched. She can't tell him anything because she'll get in trouble and they desperately need him to stay in the dark. When he does find out about his past, nobody can know about this. So he's kind of seeking answers in the wrong places. And I think he doesn't realize what he's doing to himself because if he does get found out that he knows everything and his memories have returned, they're gonna hunt Sasuke Highs down like a dog, which I mean, it'd make for a fucking amazing and interesting storytelling that like he got to run back to the ghoul side. Will they accept him and everything? Well, most of the people will accept him and Taker will definitely accept him. But of course, there's scumbags out there. So it's kind of like, yeah, he needs to find out in the dark. And if not, then it's going to be a full on. He needs to get the fuck out of there. And will the Quinkays follow him or are they going to just stay in position? You know, the, the group or whatnot. How's that going to work? Again, I totally see at some given point Shirazu, Psycho, Mutsuki and all of them having to fight him. And some of them not really having the heart to do so because they care so much about the person that really led them through Sasuke Heist. Now, Sugiyama's father, when he first drugged him, I was like, are you serious? So there's a fucking ambush about to happen. But then I started to realize, okay, so they're basically going to let him get out because he really cares about his son ultimately. And I think the reason why he did that too is because he felt if Sasuke Heist comes in here, maybe he might not be able to fight back. You know, there's a lot of things that could happen, especially Tsukiyama with his depression and his conflicted nature right now. He might not actually have the strength to want to fight or do anything. So it was like, let's just get him the fuck out of here. No questions asked. So it was good on a fatherly role. That's what a father's supposed to do. But at the same time, it's kind of like, damn, what if the Tsukiyama family gets massacred and... Tsukiyama comes back or Shu comes back and he sees maybe Sasuke Heist and right there it's like what did you do and it's gonna be a huge thing because what would Tsukiyama at that point do will he blame Sasuke thinking because remember Sasuke came to him asking him in the previous chapter are you a ghoul he'll think this was in retaliation this is revenge this isn't Ken Kaneki anymore so it could go down that path of him thinking like you fucking piece of shit traitor, my friend is dead, I want you dead now for what you did to my family, I mean, Tsukiyama's not that affectionate towards his family, he's even seemed very evil in comparison, but I think a big part of his nature is, he's a spoiled ghoul, so his nature is gonna be a little bit like looking a lot darker than it actually is, he's just a spoiled motherfucker, and all the things that he did was in a weird way, it looks evil, but for a ghoul is that he was just really spoiled, and the ending with Eto, Eto, what the fuck are you doing, stitching Kane's eyes and fucking mouth what the fuck like honestly tokyo ghoul the symbolism the art everything the storytelling in general it's like leading into very interesting places and just overall very good storytelling i mean granted the ending it seemed as though because she said i gave you my bone and there's a possibility that kane could be controlled in a way because i think the kagune kind of looked a little bit similar to eto so maybe she has him similar to like the whole noro situation and that's why all the clocks were around there as well it's almost at the same time a mind fuck i don't know if that was actually just a confused state in the background with all the waves or something or was that actually like wallpaper kind of like how when jason tortured the fuck at iconic like there's a lot of things that i'm curious about that scene very vague and very interesting and a lot of self-interpretation to take from that but ultimately i think a lot of it was to mind fuck him fuck him over with like closing his eyes and i don't know if maybe the clocks were ringing so it was like all oh, these clocks is going off and he can't even see and it's so fucking tragic if you think about it he's there tortured as fuck probably miserable as hell and he doesn't even realize that his master's mansion and everything is being invaded right now the person that he really has been by to die for for the longest time so it's really fucked up and that's tragedy right there but then again tokyo ghoul is mr tragedy itself and that a fucking psychopath like i never in a million years would have thought that that author would be like oh you're so sweet and cute whilst after stitching his fucking mouth and eyes up like that just shows that to us a complete nutcase we already knew for the most part that but uh it, it's too much of a mind fuck and what kane was saying at the end it looked it was going hiss 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 i'm curious if he was trying to say highs 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 like if he's gonna be completely after revenge like i don't think kane is like completely you know dead or anything in the mind i think it's just that now he's going to be under eto's control completely with her kagune and that chapter right there just i mean between that scenes with sasuke bugging out on akita seeing that akita actually cares about him to a certain extent like this was a fucking great chapter nine out of ten for this bad boy and that's something that tokyo ghoul can only do well not only but it's one of the few that does it where you don't need big events you don't need big fights but the way the characterization is done the character growth and the way the story is told and everything with a lot of the symbol with a lot of the symbolism and everything 
everything. It's fucking brilliant. Like, honestly, Tokyo Ghoul right now, it's really starting to heat up and we're heading towards a war possibly next chapter with the Tsukiyama family and CCG. I can't fucking wait. It's either gonna be a war or they're all gonna have dipped. They're all gonna, you know, leave the mansion or whatever, but we gotta wait and see for that. So, yeah, pretty fucking long review for these two chapters. Hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you guys thought about all of this, though. How do you feel? Do you think that maybe chapter 50 will be the big reveal where Sasuke will finally find out who the fuck he is? And if he does find out, what the fuck is gonna happen to him? You have to remember, Kaneki had a hard life. His mother, all the people he's seen die, the people he killed, this torture that he, you know, went through. Like, will he be able to sustain that mentally? And just everything about these two chapters. Let me know your overall thoughts. But that's all I have for this review. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. If you liked anything I had to say or enjoyed the video, drop me a like. I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you haven't subscribed, if you could do so as well, that'd be amazing. I'm from the world. And as always, people, have an awesome day. Tokyo Ghoul for the motherfucking win, baby. One of the best.